know, the title is challenging enough, isn't it, to think that uh, there is a man who is a son of a woman and also son of God. What we want to try this afternoon is to, is to understand why God did that. Uh, and to do that, we're going to have to read the scriptures. We don't want to bring our own opinions or thoughts into this matter. That it is important, uh, we shall find as we go along, I hope. Uh, I'm going to try and stick to the Gospel of Luke uh, for most of the passages. Um, and, and we'll just see how we go along. It'll make it easier to find the passages if you would like to look them up. So we, as we read... Uh, through our brother, the angel is sent by God to Mary uh, to explain to her what is going to happen. And I'd like to just work my way through that statement because there's some very important bits of information. Uh, first of all, we're told that, the, the Gab that Gabriel was sent to, verse 27, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. So twice in the same verse, we are told that, that uh, Mary is a virgin. And we're also told that her, her husband-to-be, Joseph, uh, was of the house of David. And out of interest, because it's important that we grasp this, Mary herself confirms that that's the position that she's in. Uh, verse 34, she says to the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? So but three times in a very few verses we are told that this woman is a virgin uh, and we're going to find out how it is that this virgin is going to conceive that's the purpose of the angel to explain it to her and therefore of course to us so uh, he says in verse 30 does the angel fear not Mary for thou hast found favour with God and behold Thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and shalt bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. Let's just have a little think about that. First of all, what's going to happen to her is what happens to every woman who has a child. It's straightforward in a sense. She says that thou shalt conceive in thy womb. It's a, it's a perfectly normal event. Except that this is going to be an exceptionally normal event, as you'll see in a minute. I was trying to just say that God doesn't use a different word to that which would be used of any woman. And she'll bring forth a son, and, she'll, and that's something that, of course, a woman of that time would never have known what child was coming. So she's, it's, she's told it's a son. And she'll call his name Jesus. And again, how strange is that? God tells her what she's got to call this son of hers. Uh, but there is a reason for that, and that is not revealed to Mary, but it is revealed to Joseph. If you'd like to just quickly have a look at Matthew chapter 1, which is right at the beginning, of course, of the New Testament, and the angel also goes to see Joseph. Joseph, for understandable reasons, by this time knows that Mary is, is expecting, and he's engaged to her, and he's, and he's understandably very worried about it. But God sends the angel to him too. In verse 20 we find the angel in a dream saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So you see, Jesus was given that name quite precisely because of the purpose that he was to fulfill. He shall save his people from their sins. Now just out of interest, Jesus' Hebrew name is Yahshua. It sounds like Joshua. In fact, in the Old Testament, people were called Joshua, but it's that, Yahshua. And it literally means, he shall save. So you can quite understand then why Jesus is called that. It could be done in Hebrew. We can't do it in English. But he was called, he shall save, because that's what his job was going to be. He shall save his people from their sins. That in itself is, is just fascinating, isn't it? 
So they both know that this boy has got to be called Jesus. But we're also told, or Mary is, rather in verse 32, more about this child. He shall be great and shall be called, and this is 32 of Luke chapter 1, sorry. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. There are two things there. First of all, this son, which is to be born of Mary, this virgin, is to be the son of God. He shall be called the son of the highest. And at the same time, he is, through Mary, a son of David. If you have a look, if you want to, in Luke chapter 3, you'll find there's a long list of the names. And you'll find that Mary descends from David, as does also Joseph. So, so there we are, told straight away, this child is going to be son of God and son of Mary. Or, perhaps we could put it another way, son of man. Now, this is where uh, Mary, of course, being in the position that she's in, wants to know how can this happen? How can it possibly be? Verse 34, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered her and explains to her precisely, the Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, the power of the highest shall overshadow thee, therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So here again you see the emphasis. This child is to be born of Mary, an ordinary woman, but is also to be son of God through this miraculous intervention by God with his power. And so twice in a very perhaps roundabout way we are told that this child is son of man and son of God, son of Mary and son of God. And what we want to try to establish is why. Uh, um, I would first of all, before we go on to that, only just for the sake of a minute, point out that the angel gives to Mary proof that what what he says is is true. He says to her, Thy cousin Elizabeth, who hath also conceived a son in her old age, in other words, past the time of childbearing, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. So he's saying, look, God has enabled this woman to have a child. This one who was past old age, and was also barren. Now those of you who know the Old Testament will remember someone else who was in that exactly that position and to whom an angel also went and said, you're going to conceive a child. For the angel says, verse 37, for with God nothing shall be impossible. So this intervention, this bringing about of a son of Mary and son of God is by God's doing and by God's will and what we want to try to find out to understand is why it's all on the basis of why he was called Jesus because he would save his people from their sins so what we're going to explore that now right so um, the, uh, the one way I want to do it and perhaps be a bit of an unusual way in a way we've tried to understand that the angel has said to, to Mary that she's going to be, he's going to be her son. In other words, to put it a different way, son of man, but also to be son of God. And interestingly, in the Gospel of Luke, that expression, son of man, is used 28 times. And, it's, and in fact, it's the strangest of things, but the Lord Jesus himself never calls himself son of God. He pointedly uses the phrase son of man in, in, on occasions where we would have said I did this or ah, this will happen to me or he doesn't you say that he uses this phrase son of man and I'd like to explore that because it's, it's fundamental actually and, and Jesus because he keeps on repeating it is pointing it out to us he's saying I am the son of man even though he knew perfectly well he was son of God as well. He always calls his God his father, so he knows that. But, he's, but in this time, he wants people to understand why he is a son of man. And we want to understand that too. 
So, I can't go through 28 uh, quotations, you'll be pleased to know, but uh, what we'll do is look at a few of them, and, and actually, I must say that when I did this for myself, I, I, I was astonished at it. Um, so the first time Jesus uses it is in Luke chapter 5. So if you'd like, please, to, to look at that with me. Now this story is about a man who is paralysed. And his friends bring him to Jesus, knowing that Jesus has made many people ill, uh, many people well, I should say, uh, with his miracles, uh, that they hope that he would do the same for this, their friend, uh, who is completely paralysed. And uh, they can't even get to Jesus. So they have to, they, what they do is to go up on the top of the house, take away some of the tiles, and drop him through, uh, so that he lands just in front of Jesus. Uh, and Jesus says then, verse 20, Luke chapter 5, he says to the man, now he doesn't say, get up and walk. He says, man, thy sins are forgiven thee. And the scribes and the Pharisees who were there began to reason, saying, who is this which speaks blasphemy? But who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said unto them, Why reason you so in your hearts? Which is easier, to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise up and walk? And you see how Jesus is reasoning. He says, I've got power and authority to make this man walk. How can it be different for me to have the authority and power to forgive sins? How, what is the difference that, are, that there is power here that I have been given? And in fact, that's what he then goes on to do. And this is the point that we want to make, verse 24. But that ye may know that the Son of Man has power upon earth to forgive sins... He says to the, to the man who's paralysed, I say to thee, arise and take up thy couch and go into thine house. So he's done the both things. He's forgiven him his sins and he's made him well. But, but did you notice verse 24? Why didn't Jesus just say, but that you may know that I have power, that I have power. All of us would use that expression and we haven't got that. Power. But do you understand what I'm trying to say? That in our normal speech, we wouldn't talk about ourselves as being a son of man or man, even. We would say, I. But no, Jesus pointedly says that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Now, we're going to develop this by following some of those, these passages. They're all related, in fact, to this fact that this son of man has the ability to forgive sins so that's our, our first thinking about it now if you'd like to move on with me now then to Luke chapter 9 I'm beginning at verse 18 this time this time Jesus asks his disciples and he says the following, it came to pass, did I tell you it was verse 18, sorry, and it came to pass as he was alone praying, his disciples were with him, and he asked them, saying, whom do the people say that I am? And they answering said, John the Baptist, but some say Elias, and others say that one of the old prophets is risen again. And he said unto them, but whom say ye that I am? Peter answered, saying, the Christ of God. And he straightly charged them and commanded them to tell no man that thing, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of chief priests, chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised the third day. And you notice that once again he doesn't say, I. He says, The Son of Man must suffer many things. Now this detail that he gives us here is intimately connected with this uh, ability to save his people from their sins we'll <coughs> go a bit further in chapter 9 because here we have another incident where Jesus is going 
to turn up in the village of the Samaritans. Now, perhaps I should explain that the Samaritans were a people who didn't get on with the Jews. Let's put it as simply as that. And Jesus sent messengers before his face, he says in verse 52. They went and entered into, into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And that, but they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just like Elias did? But Jesus turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And, and I, see you, I hope that you can see that slowly a picture is being built up. That Jesus uses this phrase, Son of Man, always when it comes to talking about saving men and women. It must be of fundamental importance. Uh, now, <clears throat> if you'd like to turn over to Luke chapter 18. Uh, I, as I say, I have missed out quite a few because there are just too many. It's worth looking at them. Uh, but I just wanted to uh, bring out the theme, if you like, of this use by Jesus of the word, of the phrase, Son of Man. So Luke chapter 18. Now he's going to try to explain to his disciples what's going to happen when they go to Jerusalem. We've already seen a bit of it. Verse 31 of, of uh, Luke 18. Then he took unto them the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Ju Jerusalem, and all the things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished, for he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, they sh he shall be mocked, spitefully entreated and spitted on. They shall scourge him, excuse me, put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. Now, first of all, have a little think about what this meant to Jesus. He knows, before ever it's going to happen, what's going to happen to him. And none of it is very nice. In fact, most of it is appalling. But he knows about it, and he keeps going ahead with it. The Son of Man. What he's saying is that the, all the things written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. Right? So he, all that which is in the Old Testament, which we haven't got time to look at, is going to be accomplished in this way. So, now, uh, finally, onto this heading, to Luke chapter 22. What the Lord Jesus did for his disciples then and for us who was, would follow him was to institute uh, the, uh, what, what some people call the communion. But really it's a simple thing of, of eating bread and drinking wine to remind the believers about what Jesus was going to do. Verse 15, he said unto them, With desire I have desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He took the cup of, of wine and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And... That, 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 that is basically well, there's a few more words it explains it a bit more but I don't, don't need to go into that that was what he instituted but all the time that he's doing this he knows in his mind that someone is going to betray him and it's in verse 21 behold the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table and truly the son of man goes as it was determined but woe to the man by whom he is betrayed. Now, first of all, betrayal is something awful, isn't it? But the man is there sitting with him at, at, the, at the meal. Now, that must have hurt. But I'm sure it did hurt. Because when the man later turns up to arrest Jesus with the soldiers, he goes up to Jesus and gives him a kiss to identify him. 
And Jesus says, Portrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? In the words say how hurtful it was. But for us, I wanted to pick out of that phrase that we just read, truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined. Now, by whom was it determined? Well, we know the answer to that. Acts chapter 2. Now, if, if you're not very familiar with the scriptures, Luke, then you look through John, and then Acts comes next. Acts chapter 2. And we're going to read just a couple of verses, but you'll see why we understand what we understand about determined here. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him, now this is the phrase we've got to get in our minds, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain now God determined that this sacrifice should take place nevertheless they were still guilty of it because they didn't do it because God wanted them to but, but God decreed that this man who was a son of Mary, son of man, and also son of God, should die in this way. And what we need now to try to understand and find out is why. Why is it that that is the case? Why was it necessary for this complicated arrangement to be made? Why was it that this virgin was chosen? Why was it that she was just an ordinary woman like any of the women in this room? Why was it that God determined, though, that the son that she would bear would be his son? I mean, it couldn't get more complicated in a way than that, could you? And yet, God wanted it. It was his determinate counsel that did it. And to bring Jesus' life to an end, at least temporarily. So, how are we going to answer it? Well, the most important thing is that Les Bailey doesn't answer that question. The most important thing is that the scriptures answer that question. And we're going to look at a passage in Hebrews chapter 2. Now, um, it would be a good idea at home to read through Hebrews chapter 2. It takes a bit of reading, I'll have to admit it, um, as does the whole of Hebrews. But it is, in fact, the most logically constructed letter perhaps with the exception of the letter to the Romans, in the New Testament. It is a, a long and fairly complicated, but nevertheless logical argument. And it goes through most of the book, the letter. It's beautifully put together, beautifully argued, all from Scripture, meaning from the Old Testament. Um, what we're going to do is to pick up uh, in Hebrews chapter 2, what it has to say about Jesus. And in fact it's all about Jesus. So beginning um, verse, with verse 6. And you'll see why. Because this links everything we've said with what we're going to read. This, the, the writer to the Hebrews in chapter 6 is going to quote from one of the Psalms. He says... He says, one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels, thou crownedst him with glory and honour, and did set him over the work of thy hands. And, and, and so he goes on, and he's quoting uh, from Psalm 8. All in the face of it, when you read it, it looks as though it's talking about men and women, men. But, but this writer tells us that it's talking about the Lord Jesus. We have his authority to understand that Psalm 8 is about uh, the Lord Jesus. So verse 9 says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honour, 
that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him, that is God, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing, bringing many sons to glory, because that's what God's purpose is, bringing many sons and daughters to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So you see that God has decreed this. The captain of their salvation, and we know who it is, don't we? Because we've been told that's what his name is about. Perfect through sufferings. Now this is, this is for us too very important. Verse 11. For both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one now the authorised version it doesn't make it very clear but it's talk, it's modern translations do a bit better uh, the RSV for example says, are all of one origin oh, the old NEB used to say all of one stock in other words that Jesus and we are all of the same we're made of the same so say it again, for both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Because of course he is. Because he's made like us. Right, verse 14 sums this up beautifully. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself Likewise, Now this is where I should be banging the table. Because do you notice, he doesn't just say he took part of the same. He doesn't just say he also took part of the same. And he doesn't just say he also himself took part of the same. He wants us to grasp the importance of this by saying he also himself likewise took part of the same. The same flesh and blood. That, and this is the reason for what we've been talking about, that through death, through his death, he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. And in consequence, verse 15, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So through his death, he delivered them who feared death. And what about that business of the devil? Now, I know there's lots and lots of different ideas about what the devil is. I want to explain what the devil is by giving you another quotation. It makes it clear that this word devil is used in a very figurative sort of sense. Let's have a look at it. It's in Hebrews chapter 9. Verse 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. Now he's talking about events that took place uh, in the tabernacle in the wilderness. It's contrasting this sacrifice of the Lord Jesus with that. For then, verse 26, must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So do you see that the word devil in that passage in Hebrews chapter 2 is really a figurative way of talking about sin. And Jesus was able to put away sin. How did he do that? By conquering it. By being not just son of man, but also son of God, having what we don't have, the strength to conquer sin. And through his death, he destroyed it in himself. A 
And through doing that, if we believe in him, he gives us that same opportunity to have sin destroyed in us by God, giving to us eternal life. But it doesn't stop there. The, the writer is determined we will grasp about this business of the Son of Man. So we read, didn't we, that, that through that death he would deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For he did not he took not on him the nature of angels. He wasn't made like an angel, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. He, he was made like a, a son of Abraham. And then he goes on, and this is the, uh, the crux. Wherefore, in all things, it behoved him. Now, that's a very old-fashioned English word. Uh, but to put it in modern English, he had to be made. If you've got an ESV, that's what it'll say. Wherefore, in all things, he had to be made like unto his brethren. No choices. This was God's determinate will. He had to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. Now, let's think just briefly about that. Jesus is at the right hand of God. We read that in Hebrews chapter 9. And he's there for us. Now, you or I, if we pray through Jesus to the Lord God, have an advocate, right, who was touched with the feelings of our infirmities, who was made like us. He's the best sort of advocate we could ever have. Not an angel who doesn't know, as far as we know, who doesn't know what it's like to be you and me. But we've got an advocate who does know exactly what it's like to be you and me. So that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. You see, all of this purpose that, that Jesus was made like unto us, he had to be made like unto us so that he could make reconciliation for the sins of the people. So that like his name said, he could save his people from their sins. There were no choices. It wasn't up to us to solve the problem of our sinful nature and death. God did it in this remarkable and challenging way. I hope you've been able to see that Les Bailey hasn't explained this to you. That it's the Bible, the scriptures. God wants us to grasp about this. To understand to what lengths it was necessary to go. For you and me to be able to live forever. How brilliant and wonderful is that? So it didn't just, Jesus wasn't just a man. Neither was he an angel. He wasn't just son of God. He was both. And it was both because the only way in which we could be reconciled to God and to sol solve this problem was through a man. A man of the same nature, but who had the strength to overcome what we can't overcome, our sinfulness. It makes perfect sense. He destroyed in himself because of him being both of those things that which has the power of death which is sin sin brings death but if we believe and know and understand that and are sure about the state that we are in then God will hear us he will listen to us through Jesus and be willing to forgive us our sins and be willing on that basis to give us eternal life and then that sinful nature that's in us will also be destroyed we shall be made like him and we shall enjoy in his kingdom which was promised by that angel to Mary though we didn't read it we shall enjoy the years and years of eternity with the Lord Jesus because he was son of Mary and son of God